Welcome to Daily Bread. If you're joining us for the first time, we are walking through the letter to the Ephesians. If you can, grab a physical Bible, grab a notebook, pen or pencil, and feel free to take some notes while we walk through these verses together. So today we are on Ephesians uh, chapter one, verses five and six. And I'm gonna go ahead and read those for us now. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he blessed us in the beloved. Notice the way that this phrase ends and begins. In love, in the beloved. We are surrounded on all sides by love, and Paul wants us to know that. The love of a father who created all things and created us and he had a purpose in mind when he did it. He placed us in the center of the divine expression of his love, the person of Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at some of these phrases. He predestined us for adoption to himself. We were created with the intent that we would belong to him. One of the most transformative elements of the gospel if this is this idea of belonging to a new family, a new humanity, a new kingdom, a new way of life. He formed you and me knowing that we would require redemption. He knew this. He knew that redeeming us would come to him at great cost. We were illegitimate estranged, children of wrath, severely cut off and beyond human effort to repair. But God planned, foreordained our adoption, and sin had mangled and distorted and disfigured our, our reality and distorted us almost beyond recognition. I'm reminded of the story of the prodigal son he took his inheritance and he went and he squandered it. He wasted it. And finally, he ends up in a place that he never imagined himself, in a pig pen, eating what the pigs were eating. And we know that that's not where he was meant to be. Intuitively, we sense that God wants far more for us, just like the prodigal's father wanted for his son. We must be found in Christ to come home to our true selves, to who we were al always meant to be. And this means that we must be recipients of this grace. But what about this specific idea of adoption? Let's look at that a little bit closer. Because Paul wasn't writing about adoption in the way that we would think about it. One commentator on these verses in Ephesians outlines the cultural implications of adoption. Paul is likely referring to the Roman understanding where the natural father would sell his son three times as a slave to the adopter. This sounds really foreign to us, but the adopter would release the son two of these three times back to the natural father. But the third and final time, the adopter became the new father. The son was not responsible to his natural father anymore at this point, only to his newly acquired father. So the purpose of this adoption was so that the adoptee could take the position of a natural son in order to continue the family line and maintain property ownership. So in Latin, the son became the patria potestis. So notice this, that the son, the adopted son, no longer had any obligation to the natural father, completely free. What does that mean for us? For those who have been adopted through Christ, the implications abound. But we'll just think about this. This means that we, as believers, formerly labeled as sons of disobedience and children of wrath, have absolutely no obligation and or responsibility to our old father, the devil, the world, the way that the world does things. We have no responsibility. We have no obligation to that. 
where we are were bound, we have been freed, freed to be holy, freed to experience the real love of our heavenly Father. And then we see that it was according to the purpose of his will, according to the purpose of God's will, his desire is all wrapped up in our adoption. This is incredible. It's what he wanted. Because when God comes for us in the person of Jesus, that is grace. And that is grace who God is. He does not just give us grace as if it's somehow separate from who he is. We often think of of God over here and grace as this other entity, but it's not. Grace is God giving us himself. And our only reasonable response is to give him all of ourselves in return. I'm going to say that again. Grace is God. It's the expression of his nature, giving us himself. And our only reasonable response is to give him ourselves in return. And then it says this, he blessed us in the beloved. Finally, that's how this verse wraps up. He blessed us in the beloved. And I want to say this, to be in Christ is to be deeply and profoundly blessed. Stephen talked about this idea uh, a couple days ago, and Blake has talked about this idea of being in Christ. In these first few verses of Ephesians, we have started unpacking some profound theological ideas, and we're only just scratching the surface. And I want to say this, this is a lifelong pursuit that will require us to live in the tension of what we can comprehend and what is far beyond our ability to understand. And so I wanna give you a couple recommendations that, that I have adopted for myself, and it's this. When I sit down with the scriptures, or when any of us sit down with the scriptures, we can know that God is utterly trustworthy. And we're not going to be able to completely understand it with our minds, but we are on a journey in that direction. And so we can trust even when it doesn't make sense. Blake said this, all of scripture is God breathed. It's him speaking to us. And so we can trust that he is going to help reveal it to us. He's going to show up. And that's the second thing. Expect, to, expect that the Holy Spirit is going to show up. He's going to illuminate the scriptures to us. He's going to help us understand. And know this, we could not do it without him. This, this Bible has no ability to change us and transform us unless God comes in and partners with us in that transformation. In fact, he's the one who initiates it. So finally, if if this time in scripture has stoked a desire for you to study scripture even more, it is better in community. And so just like Blake talked about, he said there this letter was read alongside brothers and sisters in Christ. And the uniting factor in any group is when you look at somebody else and you have this shared experience and you say, you too? And so that's exactly what what the Bible, what the scriptures are intended to be experienced as, as a group community experience. And so if you want to dive deeper into the book of Ephesians with a group, we are starting a Bible study. And if you want more information on that, go to churchonthemove.com, click on groups, and there you're going to find everything you need to get in a community to study the book of Ephesians together. Okay, so thank you so much for your time today. I hope that you join us next week. It's going to, it's going to be incredible. We're going to, we're going to continue to explore what Paul is saying as he exalts and extols God for who he is and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. So please pray with me right now. Father God, you are so good. You are so kind. And you saw us 
and you loved us and you created us with belonging in mind. And we are so thankful. Father, let our lives be an expression of the love and the grace that we have received from you in the person of Jesus. There is no greater gift, there is no greater reward than knowing you, than being in intimate fellowship with you and other believers. Thank you for the restoration and the reconciliation that we experience and are coming to know in a deeper and more profound way as we study Ephesians together. Thank you, Father, you are so good. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.